On July 17, 2014, two major events took place. Malaysian flight MH17 was downed over eastern Ukraine, presumably by a missile, and Israel began a ground invasion of Gaza. Israel's invasion was granted an almost complete media blackout. The MH17 tragedy, however, got full coverage and was immediately propagandized. The US government and the Western media pinned the responsibility for the MH17 tragedy on Russia within minutes, long before investigators had time to even arrive on the scene, much less provide any actual conclusions. Then came an all-out information war, with lies, omissions, and disinformation coming from all sides. The geopolitical implications of this event should not be underestimated. Depending on how much mileage Washington can get out of it, the downing of MH17 could end up being extremely pivotal. Anyone who knows their history knows that media coverage of events like these often lay the psychological groundwork for war. Consider the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915, for example. So who was really responsible for the downing of Flight MH17? First, let's just start by asking some obvious questions. For example, why was Flight MH17 routed directly over a war zone? This was not a normal flight path. In fact, it was 300 miles off course. Normally, planes on this flight path keep significantly farther south, and the decision to allow MH17 to fly over Donetsk was ultimately the decision of the authorities in Kiev. Now, Kiev initially claimed that they were acting under the assumption that this route was safe as long as the flight stayed above 32,000 feet, which is out of range for man-pad surface-to-air missiles. But that statement was later contradicted by Ukrainian officials who said that they knew three days before the downing of MH17 that the Separatists had the Buk missile system, which is capable of hitting aircraft at much higher altitudes. Now, to fully understand the implications of this decision, we have to look at what's been really going on in Ukraine lately. Mainstream media hasn't been talking about this very much, but for the past month and a half, the Ukraine military has been using heavy artillery and airstrikes against entire towns in East Ukraine. The shelling has been indiscriminate, with many of the munitions striking in residential areas. The civilian death toll for this bombardment was estimated at over 257 people one month ago, and the attacks intensified shortly after. Washington was silent. European officials were silent. And the UN was also silent. The separatists retreated from Slavyansk, regrouped, and over the past few weeks, they've shut down a number of Ukrainian military aircraft, effectively stalling the advance towards Donetsk. In that context, Kiev's decision to route a civilian airliner 300 miles north of its normal flight path, putting it directly over an active war zone, a war zone where they themselves were the primary aggressor, it wasn't just stupid, it was criminal. And let's remember how East Ukraine became a war zone in the first place. Did East Ukrainians invade West Ukraine or bomb them? No. The East Ukrainians held a referendum to declare their independence. They had a massive voter turnout, much higher in fact than the official elections that Washington endorsed, and the self-appointed government in Kiev responded by attempting to bomb them into submission. And again, this so-called international community just stood by and watched. And this wasn't the first time. Remember we had the Odessa massacre, where the Ukrainian police stood by and did nothing as neo-Nazis burned over 40 anti-Kiev protesters alive. Among those killed was a pregnant woman who appeared to be strangled or beaten to death. The Ukrainian government totally covered up these crimes and blamed the tragedy on the anti-Kiev protesters. Apparently, these people burned themselves alive. But let's not stop there. Let's take this all the way back to the beginning. We have evidence that it wasn't Yanukovych that used snipers on the protesters in February. The real killers came from within the Maidan coalition. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that he has some sort of, how to say, trust among all these Maidan people and, and civil society. And second, what was quite disturbing, the same Olga told that, well, all the evidence shows uh, that people who were killed by snipers from both sides, among policemen and, and people from the streets, that they were the same snipers killing people from both sides. So that, yeah. So that, and then she also showed me some photos. Uh, she said that has medical doctor. She can, you know, say that it is the same, same handwriting, the same type of bullets. And it's really disturbing that now the new, uh, new coalition that they don't want to investigate what exactly happened. So that there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind snipers they were. It was not Yanukovych, but it was somebody from the new coalition. I think they do want to investigate. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think that was interesting. Gosh. Yeah. There actually was an investigation. Almost no one heard about it because the mainstream media was very quiet about the results. Why? 
because the Ukrainian MP that led the investigation, Grenade Moscow, a man with a long history of criticizing the Berkut police, announced that he found no evidence that the Berkut police were responsible. Why is this background information important? Because it demonstrates just how far Washington's puppets in Kiev are willing to go for the sake of power. And that allows us to start asking some harder questions. Questions such as, was this just a case of gross incompetence on Kiev's part? Or was it something else? It's pretty obvious who benefits from the strategy. And we know Kiev has a history of killing civilians and blaming it on others. But would they really take it this far? For a lot of people, these kinds of questions are simply off limits. They just aren't prepared to let their mind go down that path, especially considering the fact that the US government is in bed with these guys. So let's tread carefully and just ask a few more questions that these so-called journalists in the mainstream media are neglecting to ask. For example, why hasn't the US government released its satellite pictures of the area right after the event? Right after Russia challenged the US government to produce the satellite imagery to back up their accusations, this is what Washington released to CNN. This isn't high-resolution satellite imagery taken right after the crash. This isn't even a recent map. In fact, the map itself has a date written right on it. 2010. This is just an outdated screenshot from Google Maps with an amateurish drawing layered on top. And keep in mind that five whole days after the crash, and this is all that the US government has produced so far, why don't they want to show us the real images? Eastern Ukraine has been watched like a hawk for months now. We've seen the US government hyping their satellite images every time there's a change of Russian troop concentrations anywhere near the border. You're telling me that now, when it really counts, the world's most sophisticated spy machine can't provide us with satellite pictures of a massive missile battery as it was positioned right after the downing of an aircraft? You're telling me they can't provide snapshots of the area following the missile battery as it was moved to its current location? You're telling me that they don't know where this missile battery is, right now? Or that they actually do have these images, but they're just refraining from spreading this juicy tidbit all over the mainstream media like they usually do as soon as they have something that helps their case. That stretches credulity. Interestingly, investigative journalist Robert Perry, who's best known for his work exposing the Iran-Contra scandal in the 1980s, writing for Newsweek and the Associated Press, has published an article stating that one of his trusted sources has informed him that, quote, U.S. intelligence agencies do have detailed satellite images of the likely missile battery that launched the fateful missile but the battery appears to have been under the control of Ukrainian government troops dressed in what look like Ukrainian uniforms. Does this mean that we should just take Robert Perry and his source at their word? No, of course not. But by the same token, why is the Western media taking the US government's word at face value without demanding evidence? Washington is a den of pathological liars. Their word is less than worthless. It certainly doesn't count as proof. But what about the audio evidence that the Ukrainian government uploaded in the form of a YouTube video which supposedly proves that the rebels admitted to shooting down the plane in a phone conversation? Is that recording genuine? Or did someone just splice it together? Oh right, we know it's real because the Ukrainian government told us it was real. Let's put this into context. Remember, this is the same Ukrainian government that arrested two Russian journalists in May after those journalists released footage of UN helicopters being used by the Ukrainian military in the assault against the East. The Ukrainian government claimed that these journalists were transporting rocket launchers, and they even videotaped the men bound and gagged next to a set of rocket launchers. The US government went along with the story, but then, after there was a major uproar and Human Rights Watch came out to condemn their arrest, the journalists were suddenly released without any comment or explanation. Why is this relevant? Because the current government in Kiev has a history of fabricating and manipulating evidence when it's politically expedient. The veracity of the audio should be determined by an independent investigation by multiple audio experts in multiple countries. Now, if the implications of what I'm presenting here sound crazy to you, you might want to look up Operation Northwoods. Operation Northwoods was a series of proposals written by the Department of Defense back in the 60s, which directly advocated committing acts of terrorism within the United States and specifically proposed shooting down a civilian airliner in order to blame it on Cuba. And this would be used to justify a war. These documents were declassified in 1997, and there are thousands of copies available for download on the internet. Don't take my word for it, go read them yourself. Now you might be thinking, if any of this is true, why on earth would the US government go out of their way to target Russia like this? This is really extreme. Might it have something to do with the fact that just this month the BRICS nations met to put together an international development bank specifically designed to rival the World Bank and the IMF? Could it be because Russia is now openly pushing for the de-dollarization of international trade? Russia poses a threat to the dollar. That's all the motive the US government has ever needed. But 
What if we get incontrovertible proof that the Rebels mistook flight MH17 for a military aircraft and shot it down? What should happen then? Well, ask yourself this. What would be done if this mistake had been made by the US military and the airliner had been, say, Iranian? Oh wait, that actually happened. In fact, it happened exactly 18 years before the MH17 tragedy, on the very same day. On July 17, 1996, TWA Flight 800 was downed over Long Island. The US government claimed that the explosion was a result of an internal malfunction, but numerous eyewitnesses reported that they saw a missile being fired up from the ground. And even the New York Times referred to the evidence of a cover-up as, quote, formidable. The US government never admitted they were responsible. But that's a really bad example, isn't it? Here's a better example. What if Ukraine has shot down a Russian airliner? Oh wait, that actually did happen in October of 2001. The Ukrainian government initially lied about it, but they finally came clean. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, as you can tell, I, I do as I'm told. And I thought I had to stand up at the time when my immediate predecessor would sit down. And uh, clearly, I failed. Um, good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me uh, with you. I would like to thank the National uh, Press Club, and especially President Angela Grilling Keane, for not only inviting me to this prestigious venue, but essentially presenting the outline of what I want to talk to you about now. So it's as if we had prepared that together, which we have not. Now let me first of all, of course, begin by wishing you all a happy new year. I guess it's still time to do that, given that we are just exactly halfway through between our Western uh, New Year and the Lunar New Year, which will loom in a few weeks' time. I think it's also appropriate to wish ourselves a happy new year given what I would like to talk to you about, which has to do with uh, the global economy and what we should expect for 2014. Now I'm going to test you um, numerology skills by asking you to think about the magic seven. Okay? Most of you will know that seven is quite a number in all sorts of themes, religions, and uh, I'm sure that you can compress numbers as well. So, if we think about 2014, all right, I'll, I'm just giving you 2014, you drop the zero, 14, two times seven. Okay, that's just by way of example, and we're going to carry on. So 2014 will be a milestone and hopefully a magic year in many respects. It will mark the 100th anniversary of the First World War back in 1914. It will mark the 70th anniversary, 70th anniversary, drop the zero, seven, <laughs> of the Bretton Woods Conference that actually gave birth to the IMF. And it will be the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, 25th. It will also mark the seventh anniversary of the financial market jitters that quickly turned into the greatest global economic calamity since the Great Depression. The crisis still lingers. Yet, optimism is in the air. We've left the deep freeze behind us and the horizon looks just a bit brighter. So my hope and my wish for 2014 is that after those seven miserable years, weak and fragile, we have seven strong years. Now I don't know whether the G7 will have anything to do with it <laughs> or whether it will be the G20. I certainly hope that the IMF will have something to do with it. 